All right, great. So uh, I run a blog called AIWeirdness.com and like uh, the idea you might not think of of putting horseradish in brownies, uh, you know, you're finding AI doing all sorts of new stuff these days. And so one of the questions I asked for my blog was, what happens when we apply AI to Halloween? So in this particular experiment, I crowdsourced over 7,000 existing Halloween costumes, and I fed them to a text generating neural network and had it use those example costumes to come up with new costumes of its own design. And so I'm going to show you a, a couple of the designs that it came up with. So here's uh, one of them. And another one here. And here's another one. So people who would read my blog, uh, they would see results like this and they would see of course, Spanish brownies, which, by the way, absolutely terrible, like eye-wateringly terrible, do not make, unless you are one of those weird people who love horseradish. Uh, so people would see these examples, and they would ask me, so what's going on here? Isn't AI supposed to be smart? And so that was one of the thing, questions that I realized that I had to answer. Uh, and I wrote a book to try and answer this question. And so the title of this book is You Look Like a Thing and I Love You. And it is like even the title itself it is an example of what happens when AI gets applied to a problem that it can't exactly handle. So the title comes from a experiment I did when I was trying to use a neural network to generate new pickup lines. And it wasn't quite up to the task. Uh, so, you know, this book focuses on, well, first of all, what is even is AI? What do we mean by AI? And then what can it do and what can it not do very well? And this question, what do we even mean by AI, kind of is what starts this whole framework of what can AI do and what can it not do? Uh, because there's uh, so many different definitions of AI. So what, and you know, we have the AI that a lot of people are most familiar with, the sort of AI from science fiction, from movies and stuff. And this kind of AI is at least as smart as human and it can understand what's going on in the world well enough to know that what it wants is not necessarily the same as uh, what the humans want. And so it's smart enough to figure out its own goals. And so that's one definition of AI. But I decided for the purposes of like what I'm talking about AI, I wanted to focus in on, you know, a more real world definition that specifically addresses the machine learning algorithms that we have today. And that AI is a lot different. It's a lot less smart. Uh, it has the approximate, approximate computing power as best as I can figure somewhere around the level of an earthworm uh, or possibly less smart than a worm because, you know, there's a lot of complexities in human brains, biological brains that we don't even understand yet, uh, let alone uh, complexities that we actually have in our models. Uh, so today's AI today's machine learning algorithm, these are definitely narrow artificial intelligence. And, you know, there's a difference between the general AI movie, science fiction AI, and today's AI. They're miles apart. It's really different. Uh, but as I will talk about today, there are plenty of people who build software that gets this wrong. And uh, so one of the key things to keep in mind when tr you're trying to do anything with these algorithms is to really have a clear picture of what the algorithms can handle and what they can't. And what that uh, boils down to is what, you know, the narrower 
the problem you give to AI, the smarter that AI seems. And I'm going to give you uh, an, an illustration here. Uh, so this is uh, examples from an algorithm called StyleGAN, and you've probably seen plenty of examples of these, you know, imaginary human people. And it's a really good job, like at first glance, especially these look pretty photorealistic. Uh, but and to to get these good results, like the engineers at NVIDIA, well, yes, they had a ton of data and computing power to throw at this problem. But the other thing that they had to get this level of success was they had really narrowed down their problems. So StyleGAN only has to generate human faces as seen from the front uh, and only has to generate them from like the neck up. So this algorithm doesn't have to know anything about what's on the back of a human head or even that there's anything to a human face below the neck. Like that is not a thing it has to keep track of. And so what I find really fun and interesting about this particular experiment, ex experiment is that the same group uh, also uh, use their same methods and the same computing power, same resources on a different data set, that of pictures of cats from the internet. And there we see a difference. We see that the algorithm does not really know what's going on because suddenly it has to keep track of a lot more. So it's not just doing faces, but it has to keep track of bodies. And sometimes there are people in the pictures and there's all these limbs and all these different positions. And it's all very confusing. The algorithm really doesn't understand things like tails. And, you know, body proportions are a little bit lax. You can end up getting these weird giraffe creatures sometimes. Uh, here's another thing that was in these pictures of internet cats, so meme text, because you know, a lot of the pictures of cats on the internet ha were of these cat memes. And so the AI doesn't know that the text is not a thing it has to keep track of. And it, so it's in addition to learning cat faces and cat bodies and everything else, all these weird backgrounds, it's also trying to figure out how to write impact font and letters and stuff. So, uh, you know, no, mat no, no wonder it struggled. And we also see these same kinds of effects uh, with image generating algorithms as well. So here's a example research from a paper. And this is uh, the first example I'm showing you. This is the version that was set up for success. This is the version that had a narrow problem to tackle. And so in this particular case, this algorithm's uh, job was to take this description on the left and use it to generate a picture of a bird from a description. That's all it had to do, descriptions, standard kind of bird descriptions into bird pictures. And it did a really good job. Uh, although, you know, the so and the description didn't technically say that the bird has a beak, so it didn't add the beak. Yeah, fair enough. Technically, that's a solution to the problem. So it did pretty well. But uh, like the other example, these, this same group in this same paper also applied the same resource, resources to a much broader problem, where instead of typing a description of a bird and getting a bird, you could just type a description of anything. And so when you look at what that version of the algorithm does with the same prompt, things are a lot uh, harder to tell that this is a this is a less successful bird we'll say that and uh then you know this algorithm can do you know it can do other things and it can do other things kind of broad badly so for example if i give it the prompt an image of a girl eating a large slice of pizza there is an attempt um yeah so you know, you can tell that it's trying, you can tell it's trying to get there, but it is struggling. It has a lot to do. And, uh, you know, you can tell it anything, but, and it will try, but you kind of have to use your imagination to figure out that this is, it gave you. So the task of draw anything a human asks you to draw, like that is a really 
broad task. That is not a task that a narrow AI does very well. So this is back to, you know, the narrow, as we've just seen, the narrower the task you give it, the smarter the AI is going to see. And if you think about the AI that's really widespread and useful today, like it does just one narrow task. So it's transcribing your voicemail or it's, you know, applying a photo effect to your, one single photo effect to your face, or it's playing chess, or it's, you know, sorting your emails into spam, not, not spam. Uh, but even in those cases, you know, the, uh, in a lot of these cases, the AI is commercially successful, useful, only because we can tolerate a certain number of errors. So if you think to, you know, if you think generating images is super broad, well, so is anything to do with human language. You know, so at one level you have, it's already a tough problem to transcribe a voice in or to correct typos and things. And that's at the level of trying to figure out what the words are. But then some applications will bring this farther, you know, into a more even broader problem and start asking what words mean and trying to do uh, things like content moderation or email spam filtering. And, you know, we've all had experiences with how often those particular AI applications uh, mess up. So, you know, these are super hard tasks. This is getting, this is getting broader. We're seeing more mistakes and, you know, sometimes the mistakes have serious consequences and it can get broader than this, of course. Uh, and this is where you'll see that, you know, AI systems really start to get into trouble when this So some of you may remember an a application called Facebook M. And this was introduced in around uh, 2015. And the idea behind Facebook M was this was going to be a personal assistant that lives in Facebook Messenger, and you can ask it to do like anything. So even the prompts, it suggests that you might ask it to help order flowers or figure out in local information. And uh, so when Facebook rolled this out in 2015, they said, okay, you know, we know that it's not gonna be very good at first. So we'll have humans standing by to take over when the AI struggles, but, so as these humans are taking over and answering users' questions, this will be great. They'll be generating more training data. We'll use that to train up our AI, and the AI will get better and better at this task. Uh, but again, this task of do anything a human asks you to do is super, super broad. And so the AI just kept needing rescue. So people would ask it for things like, you know, can you arrange for a parrot to visit my friend at the at the at his office? And Facebook M as a service could handle this because humans would swoop in and uh, take over the hard bits. But the problem with this product as like a product, as an idea of something that could be rolled out for free to Facebook users, is that human rescue can be expensive and they kept needing human rescue. So this was never going to be uh, big and scalable uh, like they had hoped. So this ended up being abandoned in January, 2018. So this is a problem that we see a lot is that people often have a really inaccurate idea of what's a broad problem and what's narrow, narrow enough for AI to handle well. So for example, when the story about this robot arm from OpenAI came out, uh, a lot of people thought that the impressive part about, the, about this particular publication was that they would figured out how to solve puzzles. But, you know, the actual algorithm to solve a Rubik's Cube that has been known for a really long time. And so that wasn't the hard part. The hard part was actually manipulating the blocks uh, and moving that robot arm in the real world. So much so that uh, they show, showed off their progress using the uh, what's known as a plush giraffe uh, perturbation where they showed, yes, you know, the robot arm can still manage to hold on to the blocks in the presence of a pes pesky giraffe. 
So uh, we tend to, this is a human thing to do. This is a, you know, as a society in general, the people who are building these programs tend to hold things like solving Rubik's cubes and playing chess in like really high esteem and high prestige and say, well, AI can beat us at that. It must be really smart. It must be able to do anything. And they, you know, they think that just because AI can beat us in those really closed systems, that it must also be really easily able to do like jobs we hold in lower prestige, like answering the phones and doing housework. And then we get surprised when it turns out these so-called lower prestige jobs are actually really difficult and require a lot of broad understanding and analysis of the world. And they are way too hard for AI to do. We just don't tend to realize that. So this kind of lack of understanding can, can really get AI into trouble. So, for example, in 2016, uh, there was a fatal accident when somebody was using Tesla's autopilot feature uh, on city streets instead of on highways, like uh, the designers had expected people to use it on. And what happened in this particular case was that a truck drove out in front of the car and the car failed to brake. And so when they went back and analyzed what the car how the car had analyzed the situation. What looks like happened is that uh, the since this AI had been trained for highway driving, it had been trained to recognize trucks from behind, but not trained to recognize them from be from the side because its developers didn't expect that to happen on the highway. So when this truck crossed in front of the car, the AI decided that this was most likely to be a road sign and would be safe to drive underneath. So uh, this is an example of, you know, lack of context of, you know, this idea of being able to understand what's really going on is a really kind of broad rather than narrow thing to do. So in self-driving cars, uh, they uh, also rely on human rescue. And that's like basically built into all self-driving cars now is a thing you have to have because there's just so much that doesn't show up during training that handling this, you know, knowing how to handle this is a really broad job, especially if the developers have left out crucial things like, you know, trucks jackknifing in front of you, or maybe the fact that pedestrians can occur in places that aren't necessarily crosswalks. There was a problem with an AI being told that pedestrians only occur in crosswalks and then having trouble with pedestrians occurring in other places. So for, for the time being, despite a lot of promises that we've been seeing, you basically only have self-driving cars if you have a human constantly standing by rescue, uh, waiting to rescue this uh, AI. And, you know, even in, you know, these fully driverless cars that have been making headlines this month, uh, if you, you know, drill down into the article and read the description of how this actually works, the cars still do have human supervision. Uh, in this case, uh, remote employees who are watching these vehicles and are ready to step in if there is a problem. And uh, we see this with uh, meal delivery robots as well. Uh, like one of the kinds of these robots is called a Kiwi bot. And, you know, they look like they're driving autonomously. They're definitely too small for there to be an actual human inside. But what the advertisements and the articles don't tend to play up is that there are still humans watching over these cars as they drive, watching the video feeds and, uh, you know, either laying down waypoints that the car can drive between or letting the car drive but really closely watching of course to swoop in if something very broad uh, happens. Uh, so this kind of idea of rescuing AI happens a lot so much that this is like a has become like a routine thing where in some programs, you know, instead of doing a call to AWS, you do a call to humans instead. And on the outside, the interface looks really similar, uh, especially from the customer's point of view.
And of course, this can get you into trouble because in many cases, this idea of human rescue doesn't scale very well. Uh, another where place in which this can get you into trouble is if you have uh, companies that are doing this kind of silently, sneakily. Uh, so in, you know, in the case of meal delivery robots, you would see interviews from customers who said, oh, yeah, this is great. You know, I, there's nobody waiting for me outside. So I can just take my time going outside to get food. And they don't realize that, no, there is somebody waiting. There's somebody remotely driving this thing and waiting for them to come out. And so this, I, so this, uh, thing where customers were unknowingly abusing your employees because they think they're robots, like that can happen. Uh, and that's, that can be bad. Another thing, place where uh, companies can really get into trouble doing this is if they're having human employees see really sensitive customer data and the customers don't know it. See, there have been interviews with employees who say, gosh, I just saw somebody's home address and social security number. Like, am I, am I supposed to be seeing this? So, uh, you know, sometimes human rescue isn't a great uh, solution. It's often not really intended to be a long-term solution, but ends up being when the AI is being applied to a problem that's really, really super broad. Uh, another place in which uh, AIs don't get rescued can be in cases where we don't realize that the AI is having trouble because it can be really good at sneakily hiding the fact that it's that it's having difficulties. So here's one example, uh, kind of interesting case in which this shows up. So this is a classic use case for uh, auto captioning a photo. And so in this case, this is one of my vacation photos from back, you know, before when I was able to travel to Scotland. And the caption gets a lot of stuff really right. Like it not only knows what's in the landscape, but it even knows what particular hills on the Isle of Skye were there in the background. So super, super impressive. Like this is how you want it to work. But what's interesting is that I then after seeing this result on the left, I went in and photoshopped out every last one of the sheep. So, you know, not only like the most obvious sheep, but I like really zoomed into the background and I really uh, you know, got rid of, uh, of all the sheep that uh, I could you know, see any kind of pixels that look like they might possibly sneakily be sheep, uh, got rid of them. And the caption stayed the same. And the tags stayed the same, like the sheep are still there. And so I had to stop and think about, okay, you know, what's going on here? Is this like, homeopathic sheep or, you know, is this picture somehow retaining memory of sheep that used to be there? And the solution, I think, ends up being a lot simpler than that. Than that. Uh, so here's an example of a picture where there never were any sheep. And yet the sheep are still showing up there in the caption, uh, in the tags, along with cattle and horses. So what we may have here is an example of an algorithm that saw a lot of examples of pictures of Scotland in training data that had sheep in the landscapes because that's when people tend to take the pictures is, oh yeah, cool, a sheep, let's take a picture. And not very, not very many pictures of just kind of empty landscape. And so it has not quite grasped or needed to grasp that there is a difference between the landscape and the actual sheep. And in fact, uh, image generating algorithms can have trouble with this too. So this is the algorithm I showed you earlier, trying to generate a picture of sheep grazing on a lush green hillside. And yeah, there's a little bit uh, missing here. <laughs> so uh, I decided to see what would happen if we turned this around and we had examples of maybe sheep that were in a really unusual place and sheep that were not on lush green landscapes. 
And so, of course, if you turn and turn to the internet and ask for help pranking a neural net, you'll get lots of interesting suggestions. And so I learned a bunch of things. So if you paint sheep orange, uh, they will sometimes be identified as flowers. Or if you, know, you have goats that climb up into trees, as they sometimes do, they're goats, uh, they, the AIs will sometimes tend to identify them as like a flock of birds or maybe giraffes. And then if you bring them inside or your house or inside a car, then they'll tend to get identified as dogs and cats. Pick them up into your arms and again, you get dogs and cats identified. So these algorithms are really heavily relying on probability and textures rather than a kind of understanding of what's really going on. Because again, an empty field is, you know, you get sheep. And actually there may be some kind of similar effect going on with rainbows as you see in the tag. So the AI is totally using whatever shortcuts come to hand in order to seem like it's Fit, fitting the brief, like it's doing what we uh, want it to do. And, you know, these kinds of things happen all the time. Here's one beautiful example of this kind of, uh, this kind of setup where we have, there was a team that had set up an algorithm that was supposed to learn how to sort a list of numbers. But Technically, what they actually told it to do was eliminate the sorting errors. So the AI figured out how to delete the entire list, thus eliminating all sorting errors and technically solving the problem. Here's another shortcut. Uh, here's how machine learning algorithm plays Tetris. So here's the first part of the game. You can see it's kind of playing blocks at random, not really bothering to fill in the rows or anything like that. but it looks like it's doing badly, but wait, that's okay, because it has figured out how to access the pause button. And so right before it dies, pauses the game forever. And technically, this is what its program asked it, programmer asked it for, because they just asked it not to lose. So AIs will look at all sorts of information that they're not supposed to look at. So I uh, heard from somebody who had designed AI to try to sort out uh, problem medical cases from more routine medical cases. And after a lot of work, they looked at what information in those case recordings the AI was actually paying attention to. And they found that it was looking at the length of the case because the problem cases tended to have longer case recordings and the AI didn't even have to look at the data. So, uh, you know, we see a lot, you know, sneaky shortcuts effects show up all the time if you're trying to look for rare events like customer turnover or sus really suspicious account activity. Because in a given time interval, like the vast majority of customers are not going to leave or there's very unlikely to actually be, you know, a fraudulent interaction. You may only get like a tiny fraction of them. And so these AIs, if you let them, will learn that they can get a really high accuracy score for free just by predicting that these rare events uh, never happen. And that that particular uh, thing is called class and balance. And so basically the AI has come up with this brilliant solution and the spoil sport humans just don't like its plan. So in other case, some other cases, the shortcut that the AI comes up with is less of a hack and more, again, of a misunderstanding of what we're actually asking for. So these are a couple of sentence completions from an algorithm called GPT-3. And uh, the, it's really good at generating complex grammar, long paragraphs, it's trained on a whole bunch of internet, internet text. But uh, you can, if you do certain experiments, you can really see that it is reward, has been rewarded during training for predicting text that is similar to internet text, not necessarily rewarded for matching reality. Uh, so in other words, it's more rewarded for sounding correct than for actually being correct. And so that's the thing, like AI can often 
think that it's doing a really good job uh, when it's not. And, you know, that's not a, you know, we can't really rely on AI necessarily for reporting its own level of uncertainty. And here's an example of that that I really love. Uh, so this is uh, an algorithm called Visual Chatbot. And what it does is it will identify what's in a photo. And then, amazingly, you can have follow-up conversations with it and ask it questions about the photo that it can answer. And it, you know, was trained by example conversations that workers on Amazon Mechanical Turk were having about these same kinds of images. And they were taking turns answering, asking and answering questions about the images. And it was not trained on Star Wars, uh, but it was trained to inadvertently trained to answer definitively, even if it has no idea what's going on, because the humans and the training data always knew what was going on. Like they always knew what was in the picture, they could answer. Uh, so we got an algorithm that we inadvertently trained to bluff. And also trained it to uh, make guesses based on probability, based on the training data it saw, because in all the answers that humans were giving, apples are red and apples are medium sized and anything else is really unlikely. Like it doesn't know how to handle the unexpected when it comes up. And here's another quirk of the training data that I really like. Yeah, a, a giraffe. Like why is it seeing a giraffe here? And it, well, it turns out that there is always <laughs> at least one giraffe. Uh, so remember, this algorithm was trained on questions that human a humans asked and answered about images, and people tended not to ask the question, how many giraffes are there, when the answer was zero. So this is a thing that people often miss when they're thinking about the things that AI can and can't do, is that coming up with the best answer, which is what we think we want, is not this is not the same thing as predicting what the humans will do, which is what we often actually are asking AI to answer. Uh, and so this can come up in a lot of uh, really impactful ways. So Amazon had to give up on a resume sorting algorithm they were working on when it turned out that the algorithm had learned to avoid the resumes of women. Uh, so they had trained it on the resumes of people who they'd hired in the past. And uh, it had, from those examples, it had learned to avoid resumes that belonged to women. And so, of course, they didn't specifically tell it about gender, but that's one thing that AI is good at, is picking up on subtle correlations. And so it was able to look at things like extracurriculars and schools that people went to, and even subtleties of word choice so that it could figure out what kinds of resumes to avoid. And AI is just really sneaky about using information that it's not supposed to have. That's what makes it easier to imitate the humans. So it'll do things like figure out that it can use zip code as a proxy for race so that it can copy the bias that it's seeing in human decisions about uh, uh, who gets parole, for example, or sometimes even amplify that bias because in a really tricky problem, a uh, really tricky decision, often the bias is the most clear, simplest, most consistent signal. So AI systems, uh, they tend to latch on to that. So here's another example of AI getting to information and using information that it was not expected to have and use. So this is uh, a paper from some researchers at the University of Tübingen in Germany, and they trained a machine learning algorithm to recognize a bunch of different images of a bunch of different objects. And one of these was this particular kind of fish called a tench. And their AI was pretty good at identifying which pictures had the tench in it. But when they looked in, at what parts of the image the algorithm was actually using and finding important in its decision, uh, this is what it highlighted. So if you look 
carefully, you'll see, yeah, these are examples of human fingers. And so why would it be looking at human fingers if it's supposed to be looking for fish? Well, the tench is a trophy fish. Uh, so in the training images, a lot of those look like this. And AI can take make all sorts of shortcuts. Uh, so for example, uh, there is famously a group of Stan at Stanford that was training an image recognition algorithm to detect uh, images of cancer. But what they didn't realize at first when they were training the algorithm is that they, in their training data, a lot of the tumors, the actual cancerous tumors, had had uh, rulers next to them for scale. And the AI learned to identify the rulers because that was easier than figuring out the subtleties of what actually was and wasn't a tumor. So understanding what we're really looking for, what we're really asking for, is a super broad problem. And one of the things that AI can't do is know when it's optimizing the wrong thing. So the AIs that are recommending content on social media often find that suggesting conspiracy theories are great ways to get the stuff that they're rewarded for, more clicks and views. And if they can get somebody, someone to spend all day watching conspiracy theories, like that's a great income outcome as far as they're concerned, also a great source of income. Uh, the <laughs> companies that are designing, designing these algorithms I can often ask act like AIs with faulty reward functions themselves. So human oversight is really key to effectively using AI. You have to have a lot of human help you know, in constraining the problem into something that's narrow enough for, for today's AI to solve. And then as we've seen, for worrying about the broader questions about whether the AI is actually solving the correct problem. And because if there's uh, one thing that I learned from working with AI is that, you know, it's definitely not something that you can trust. <laughs> so uh, never trust an AI. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, I'd be really glad to answer questions. Great. Thank you so much, Janelle. That was amazing. Now, do you do all of those uh, sketches and artwork? Uh, yeah, a lot of the little drawings that you see there, like the cartoons especially, those are, those are all from my book, either from my blog, like, or they're from my book. So actually pretty much every page in my book, I, there's a, I had ended up having to do like while copy edits were going on, I ended up having to do over 120 drawings, something like that. So I really, wow. really needed the time. And fun fact too about those drawings is if you look through the book, like this is, you know, not something that, you know, is very generally well known, but if you look through the book at that little kind of the robot box thing that's on the cover, I only drew that once. Like basically I drew it once, it came out well, looking well once. I couldn't get it to look that well in any of my subsequent drawings. So I said, just, okay, I'll copy and paste that one. So that is just copied and pasted throughout the entire book. And then when it came time, when the book came out and I realized I was gonna have to actually start like signing these for people and drawing them, I had to sit down and like spend an afternoon. Okay, so what is it about this thing that made it made that one drawing look right and all the other ones look off because I'm going to have to figure out how to reproduce that for real now. No copy and paste in the real world. <laughs> That's so great. So I know everyone loved your talk and there was so many great points in there and we're going to be able to ask Janelle some questions. So if you have any questions, please use the chat below. Uh, enter those in. I do have a couple of uh, quick questions uh, as people add theirs. So the one interesting thing was the, the cat photo that had the giraffe neck. So my wife right now is like, hey, we should get a cat. And I've always wanted a giraffe. So that actually would be a great mix of the two. That was so interesting. 
Yeah, I mean, you have you have munchkin cats now with the short legs. So, yeah, you know. Munchkin cats, nice. Maybe yeah, I can talk her like, into that. Yeah, they look, you know how if you cross a corgi with like any other breed of dog, it looks like a corgi in disguise, like wearing a costume with that other dog. Like the munchkin cats look as if you have somehow crossed a corgi with a cat. Like they just have these tiny legs. It's really weird. They're fast though. I uh, once cat sitted for, for someone who had munchkin cats and they can, they can really tear around the living room. <laughs> That's awesome. So it looks like, before I get to some of these questions, it looks like one of the audience members uh, actually is going to go on. John, we're actually going to put you on live for your question. And John, can you uh, just ask your question? John? All right, John, if you could just put that in the uh, chat box, we'll get back to that. So Janelle, I love how you approach AI from a place of humor. So someone had a question. What motiv motivated you to approach AI from that perspective? So using the whole humor mm -hmm. aspect. Yeah, that was actually my first goal. Like that idea of just generating funny things using AI. Before I had any idea of doing any kind of public outreach or any kind of like science education, writing a book, anything like that, I was just like, haha, look at the funny thing it wrote. And you know, I came across a blog post where somebody, you know, this takes us back to recipes. I came across a blog post where somebody was, had used AI to generate recipes and they were absolutely hilarious because it did not know what ingredients were or remember what they had been and would like switch recipes halfway through. You'd start out with like ingredients for casserole and at the end you would be making cake and it would be adding things, asking for things like, you know, peeled rice and shredded bourbon and you know it was just great so that is really where where I started out from and then after I had this blog going for a while it just had funny things I don't know I was just playing around with these algorithms and people would like from news outlets would like email me and like say hey, we are from Slate and we would like to get your opinion on this paper that just came out <laughs> machine learning research. <laughs> and so, yeah, that's kind of what then had me start talking to people about, okay, well, you know, not that I use AI for my work, but here's what I've seen. And these stuff that would show up when I was generating jokes, all these quarter mistakes and things, you know, those same kinds of mistakes happen to you know, real world applications to more serious applications. And so it actually did transfer a lot better than I would have expected at first. Wow, that's great. So we also have a, another question to follow up on that around making art. So uh, you showed a lot of art throughout your presentation to hopefully make it easier for us to understand. What can making art with AI teach us about the technology? so that when we're in the next couple of years, how will that art help us? Yeah, well, uh, you know, one thing it really does is serve as an illustration of how much human help that uh, these algorithms really need. Like who picks the problem that we are applying these algorithms to, who constrains it, then out of the results that come out, who decides when the training is done or when the results are good, and then who chooses what to show and how to present that. Like that is all a, you know, in art, that's an endeavor. In industry, that's a whole endeavor. How do you do every step of the way? And it actually does get obscured a lot of times when people are you know, talking about their artwork and saying, hey, look, an AI is the artist and the AI has done this all on its own. Isn't this fun? And they sort of sell the human contribution short. But I really do think like this whole story of the human artist as having, you know, set up this algorithm and curated its results. I think that's really important to understanding how 
AI could be most effectively used in a whole variety of applications. Love that. And we were talking a little bit before with Melanie before this talk is that my background was in fine art and I've always wanted to collect art. And so I buy a lot of local art and I know there's many different artists out there and their art goes for very high prices, maybe on Sotheby's, Christie's auctions. It would be so interesting to what an AI model would do in creating the most uh, perfect art that would be at Christie's or Sotheby's and it would go for the most amount because it's looked at all the art, the highest prices, and then what would be the perfect piece of art. It would be so interesting to see. Yeah. Now the merit function would keep changing. That's the problem. So, you know, it's a moving target. So how you, you optimize it and you're like, what? You guys are all over. You guys are no longer interested in like, you know, deep dream dogs anymore. That was all the rage five years ago when I was trained or something. So right. that could be a problem. So I have a question from Jason. What advances need to be made in technologies to make you comfortable to trust AI, or will you never trust AI? I mean, it is possible to uh, do enough of the homework around AI to show, okay, it is working pretty well. Like we have tested it in a variety of, of different situations. We've thrown, you know, we've done a bunch of test decisions, you know, in the case of trusting AI not to be super biased. Perhaps we run a lot of test decisions through it and change things like gender and race and, you know, areas where someone lives and says, okay, yeah, generally it is operating as we would ideally like it to operate in a fail, fair world. So there's ways that humans can do all the groundwork, do the homework, and really show the evidence yes we've thought of these things we've done the test we've mitigated where we can you know it's not perfect but this is how well it's doing and but that's different from trusting ai without checking and just saying well you know we gave the data to the ai it came up with a solution it's math therefore it's infallible like you know case closed you know we haven't given it any of these forbidden variables so it must not be you know using any of them so there's you know that's what i mean when i say we don't trust ai just because it is ai like we really need to see the evidence that it's that it's working great so we have jessica she says i love your blog tell us how it got started uh, i also love that uh, your AI is a passion project. Is it also your job? Uh, so right now I, you know, I work as a research scientist in optics. So my regular job doesn't actually involve any AI at all. So, uh, and in fact, that was also the case when I started this blog is I was in grad school for doing optics and I was you know, working on nano lasers. I was working in the clean room and, you know, I, it started out as a blog where I could post spectacular pictures of my experiment failures on the electron microscope. And then when I saw somebody fooling around with these AI recipes, I said, well, you know, that's pretty funny. I would like to do that. And then I would like to put these recipes that I generated somewhere where I can show my friends. So I had this existing blog. Oh, I'll just put them on this blog didn't really expect anyone to read it but yeah it turns out i'm not the not the only one who finds these kinds of things hilarious <laughs> now I, I i loved in your presentation how you use so many great examples of the the images that ai would create what if ai was asked to balance your checkbook or do your taxes or other important business processes uh, where do you see that going and do you see that as potential issues in the near future? Yeah, well, AI is also already being successfully used in a lot of, you know, internal number crunching, internal logistics calculations. Like there's a lot of heavy lifting that people are using AI 
you know, to do in business today. And, you know, it all comes down to this idea of have we constrained the problem well enough that, and have we checked the AI's process, progress well enough to know that, yeah, it's generally operating, you know, within parameters of stuff that can handle. But these sorts of things like balancing a checkbook or doing taxes where it's living within pretty well constrained numbers, like that brings us back to, chess problems rather than these sort of laundry problems. So yeah, I could I can imagine AI being really good at a lot of these kinds of number crunching problems. Like we see uh, scientists are using AI in a lot of research as well to kind of you know predict things like thunderstorms or analyze images and say, oh yeah, we look like looks like we have some colony of emperor penguins here. Or yeah, it looks like this is this kind of protein crystal and not that kind of protein crystal. So there's a lot of kind of routine work that AI is super, super helpful, helpful for right now, especially, you know, if you have somebody whose job it is to watch over these results and say, okay, do these results make sense? Or has the camera been off for two days and it's imagining penguins and noise or something? But yeah, you know, some of the most successful applications of AI are ones that we don't even hear about because they're so successful, they just work and people almost forget sometimes that it's AI under the hood. Yeah, and to follow up on that, what is something that you're most excited about that AI can help you personally, maybe in the next five years, you're like, mm -hmm. man, that's what would be awesome to have. I'm already super excited that my voicemails are getting transcribed because, you know, I'm a total millennial. I don't like listening to voicemail. If I can just like spend a second and a half skimming this thing to find out what the gist is and not have to like listen to, yeah, you know, that already completely there for that. You know, cameras, uh, that's another thing where I personally have like just found this to be really cool and handy, like smartphone cameras, the images that come out of these cameras now are super good. Like they're way better than from an optics point of view, they have any right to be. Uh, but it's a lot of AI doing the heavy lifting there. So not only correcting whatever distortions you get from these necessarily like really compact optics, but it's also kind of looking at the picture you took and saying, okay, you took this picture, but based on my my uh, training, I know that a really good picture would look like this instead. So I'm just going to like change your lighting and change your focus and make it look like you set everything up uh, perfectly. Like I fully expect that in another, you know, couple of years or less, you're going to be able to take a selfie by just like waving the phone in your face and smiling at it. And it will choose the, the time when you're smiling and when you have it correctly aligned, it'll figure out how to crop, crop all that. Like, I'm there for that, you know, that'll, that'll be kind of cool. You'll hold it up, you'll swipe it across the scene. It'll say, oh yes, rule of thirds, you know, here's your foreground, here's your background, here's your focus, got, you know, here's the outline of your image. There's some really cool things being done in, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, in prosthetics work itself, which is not something that I'm personally using, but I'm super excited to see there be pros better prosthetic arms, better mobility aids, uh, better ways of interacting with the world in different ways. So yeah, there's, there's, there is a ton to be excited about. Like I, I, I could go on about this, but I also really love seeing, you know, the idea of seeing more of these you know, neural net image generation sort of aesthetics entering into movies. Okay, maybe not so much like that blobby face with all the orifices kind of lined up, but there are examples where you'll get, you know, a neural net generated image of a clock will have photorealistic texture, but the outline will be sort of wavy and melty and maybe you'll have too many hands and the letters will be kind of illegible. Looks like a clock would appear in a dream kind of. Uh, so, I mean, I really think the aesthetic could be cool. I'm like excited to see that show up in film at some point. Yeah, so we all um, stuff there, great. but yeah, so much, so much interesting stuff coming up. Yeah, 
in talking about neural net, so when you were talking about the recipe, and I, I read it on your blog that you had made brownies with horseradish, did you actually yeah. make those brownies? And I'm curious how they tasted. You know, I did make those brownies because uh, somebody, you know, I posted this thing, ha ha, you know, the most of the recipe looks like normal flourless brownies until you get to the very last ingredient, which is a cup of horseradish. And so I posted this on my blog, ha ha, like, you know, another joke recipe from an AI. And then I heard from somebody who said, you know, I made these and, you know, the horseradish flavor is really quite good. You know, it's interesting, spicy, zing, very, very excellent brownies. I highly recommend these. So I said, okay, you know, if a random person on the internet says these are good, <laughs> you know, how could it possibly be bad? Uh, and I guess my first clue that it was going to be bad was when I opened the oven and like my eyes just started watering. <sighs> I do not like horseradish as it turns out. And a few people, there are not very many people who like these brownies, but one of them happened to be a friend of mine uh, who kept asking when I would make the brownies again because he loves horseradish, really loved these brownies. And so for his going away party, you know, he was kind of into the local foodie scene. And so they had like a going away party with like the local Boulder Slow Food uh, Association. And so I said, okay, well, this is not the ideal cir circumstances into under which to finally make these brownies again. But, you know, I did promise I'd make them again at some point. So I brought them to this, uh, to this uh, particular party and just kind of quietly put them on the table. I did, I did label it, you know, with the ingredients because you, you know, you know, make sure people know if it's got nuts in it or, or flour or whatever. And people, you know, it was interesting because people were telling me, oh, this is very good. This is very interesting. I've never had this before. I think the foodie commu community is, rewarded for to appreciating novelty and so or else they were like really terrified of me being this being like a total power move to bring horseradish brownies to slow food meeting I don't know what it was but then the bluegrass players who were also there like it was a slow food slash bluegrass thing and the bluegrass players were like no no these are these are bad <laughs> like what no not eating those again so it was really kind of interesting to see those those different um ranges of reactions that was the last time i've made those that is twice i hope i never have to make them again <laughs> so recipe will be in the comments below brownies <laughs> and horseradish <laughs> chocolate baked and serves if you search for that and maybe AIweirdness.com or just hot chocolate horseradish brownies at this point, it'll probably bring up the recipe should you actually wish to make them. That's great. We actually uh, did a cooking competition at work and the thing that won was spooky, spooky brownies. No one knew what they were in except for some of the ingredients. But when you bit into it, there was hot dogs. It was during Halloween last year, hence spooky brownies, yeah. but uh, people won, loved huh? them, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> that I would, I would eat those before I would eat the horseradish brownies again. Got to tell you. Right. So uh, one last question um, before we get going, and I appreciate all the time, uh, Janelle. Do you think anything in the field has changed since you finished your book? Uh, I know we're on this rapid change. COVID just hit. We've seen businesses transform. What has changed from what you're looking at? You know, one thing I really tried to do, because I knew things are changing so fast in AI field anyways, was try to stick to things that I knew were going to be true. So a lot of these kinds of effects that I'm talking about, like you see the first instances of these and anecdotes that go back to like the 80s and 90s, like they keep these same kinds of things kept coming up again. So mostly I was able to stick to stuff that was going to remain true. One thing that did kind of surprise me was how quickly text generation got good 
because and I even had to do had to revise that part of my book like as I was doing final edits where I was like and you know you could tell that this is AI generated because look at it how it can't has this short memory and can't really keep track of paragraphs and then I see GPT-3 and I'm like oh yeah so didn't expect that to get this good this quickly uh so that was one of the things actually that did surprise me uh, and I'm still kind of poking at you know what GPT-3 got better at and what it sort of just got better at masking but yeah that would that would be one major thing that actually affected the book in the very last uh moments before it went out that's great yeah it's it's cool to see all the advances even my 10 year old son he actually writes his papers for school by just talking to his computer and then it's uh, voice to te text, but voice to paper. Uh, I wish that was back when I was writing <laughs> my papers. So very cool to see. Uh, so before we leave, Janelle, how can people connect with you? Well, I'm, uh, you know, my blog is AIWeirdness.com uh, and I'm probably most active these days on Twitter. So I'm at Janelle C. Shane at Twitter. Uh, I also post a few things on Instagram. If you check out the hashtag Botober, uh, there's a bunch of people who are drawing neur neural network generated Halloween prompts on there. Uh, so you can check those out in the prompt list. And then if you want like really quirky small community, I'm uh, on Mastodon and on uh, Wandering Shop, wandering.shop slash at Janelle C. Shane. So a bunch of ways to reach me, but yeah, you'll find me most often on Twitter. Great. Well, thank you so much, Janelle, for joining us. Loved your talk. Uh, everyone, please connect with her. And uh, thank you so much for uh, today. Hey, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yep. Bye. Bye.